Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Hello, buddy. Welcome to an exciting week. Why? The final week. The NBA regular season, so much at stake. And more importantly, what about this Monday? How happy are you feeling following that gigantic win in Phoenix? A game the Pelicans had to have. This is what it sounded like on the Pelicans radio network. Zion, hard of the rim. Clear space by putting a left shoulder down, putting Kevin Durant on ice skates and lays it in. Well, finger that. Oh, my. Reach in her, poked it away, but Beal somehow got it back, and then Zion smashed another block. That's two weak side blocks for Z. Stop, pop, three, McCollum. Nothing but net from the right wing. Roll them up and smoke them, CJ. Six threes for McCollum. And Jose released because Book flopped, so he almost got a layup out oh, of it. Oh, with the jumper. Pulls up from 10 feet. Around and down, are you kidding me? What in the world did I just see? Z mini. It's like the Sasquatch. What is that? Now Jose, wide open, left wing three. That is his season high fifth of the afternoon. He's got 15 points. He has just come out shooting. Got it to Beal. Beal, hand check, drives in, takes three steps. And Zion blocked another one. And Z says, give me that. Up the floor, Murphy. Murphy Euro's in. He walked. He yeah, he they didn't call it. Several steps. Now Zion splits defenders somehow, soars and scoops. That pass wasn't even for him. He stole that from her. Five minutes to go. We're officially in clutch time. Pels are 12 and 14. Williamson mid range again. No. 15 feet left of the lane. Nothing but net. Z Mitty. Let's just give him a new name. He cannot. Be stopped. If he can make that shot, what are you going to do defensively against Zion Williams? He just pulled up from Pull up 15 jumper. feet. Pull up jumper from Zion. Durant, deep right wing. Eubank sets a pick. Durant, Euros in. Bob from behind by Zion. My heavens. Z has cleaned up the trash several times. That's his fifth block. Zion has got 25. Sizing up Nurkic, takes it right at him, and will throw it down with a right hand, Big Z. Z with the rumble, young man rumble. And he went off hand. Durant backs off, goes through the legs, ball on the deck, it rolls to McCollum with two, with one running right hand. Floater is good for CJ, and that puts him over 30 points. Well, I don't know if Z gets an assist for that. Chicken salad. But he did everything possible to make that basket happen. Got a little chicken salad out. He did get an How did he get an assist for that? <laughs> Shot clock at 14. Now the ball's in Williamson's hands with 10. Up four. Chess it to McCollum. Not much going on here. Back to Z with five. Got to go. Got to go. Hard to the rim. Throws it up. Got the roll with a left hand. Oh, my heavens, Williamson. He went through the entire Suns defense. Are you not entertained on this Sunday afternoon? John DeShazer, Ty Graffinini with the calls there. 113-105. It was the final. Zion Williamson, what a game. We're going to have a lot to get into that with Jim Eikenhoff for Pelicans.com. C.J. McCollum led the team in scoring with 31 points. Zion at 29. Head coach Willie Green overall in the win. I want to start off just by thanking God, giving glory to God. And um, that's, a, that's a fun team to have an opportunity to coach. Those guys are resilient, and they know – what we're playing for. And um, this team has beat us twice, pretty similar. Booker, you know, hitting incredible shots. And, and we wanted to come out tonight and, and um, play with a level of toughness that we know is up to our standard. And that's what we did. CJ McCollum. Yeah, I mean, we, we had a good good practice day where, you know, coaches basically told us we just got to go out there and hoop, man, and have fun and just enjoy the moment. And I think we did that. We got off to a better start after the first few minutes. And, you know, every game is a must-win game. So I think it's just a mentality of just playing hard and trusting your talent, executing it and playing for your teammate. And, you know, outside of that, that 
terrible loss against the Spurs. We lost to some good teams. So it's just about you know competing at a high level and giving yourselves a chance. And I thought we did that tonight. Zion Williamson. It's that time of the season. Um, you know, me and Coach spoke, and um, we're just taking it one game at a time. Every game for us is very important. Um, we understand the situation we're in, and you know, we're gonna play the cards dealt to us. And what about the job Jose Alvarado did off the bench, coming in and helping out with 15 points, knocking down five threes? Yeah, you know, um, just compete. You know, I, I, I want to do what I do best. And, you know, obviously I got good energy. And, you know, I'm going to play defense. But don't get it twisted. I could, I could hoop. And I think my teammates believe in me. You know, my coaching staff believe in me. And that's who I believe in myself. You know, and that's the biggest thing for me. Time now to bring in Jim Eichenhoff for New Orleans Pelicans.com. Jim, I, literally you and I sat down before we started recording. There's so much we could talk about this game. Let's yeah. just start with the basics, though. How big was that win yesterday afternoon? I mean, it was huge. It was the difference between we can legitimately, seriously, and not be laughed at talking talk today about being in the top six. I mean, they have the same record as Phoenix. Technically, the Suns are sixth. Pelicans are seventh at 46 and 32 apiece. And we can have that discussion. If they had lost yesterday, I think we'd be talking about, you know, hey, what what are our plans for the play-in tournament? Because that's where they're definitely going to be. Now, they're definitely not in the clear by any means, and they need to, need to keep winning, and they're also going to need some help from in the form of Phoenix losing a game or two here or there over the next week. But, I mean, they now have a chance to – be in the top six and achieve their goal of being a playoff team and completely avoiding the play-in tournament, which after the last two years of them being a nine seed, one year they got in in 22. Last year they did not, obviously. They lost immediately to OKC. Mm -hmm. That would be a very welcome sight for them to be in the top six and get the sixth seed and to avoid the playing tournament, I think there would be a pretty big celebration around these parts if they're able to achieve that this week. No doubt. Look, let's, there's, there's a lot to get into as to why this team won yesterday and what it took for them to win from the bench play to what C, uh, CJ did and and what I'm calling Zion's maybe perhaps best professional game in his career. We're going to get it into all be. of that. But mm -hmm. let, to your point, here's the seriousness of the fact. You have four games remaining for the Pelicans. Got a game tomorrow at Portland. Then you're at the Kings on Thursday. That's on TNT. And then on Friday is the Golden State Warriors. And then the Lakers here at home on Sunday. Four games remaining. Phoenix. They have four games remaining as well, Jim. They host the Clippers. Then play the Clippers. That's in a back-to-back -back on the 9th and the 10th. Then they're at the Kings. Then they're at the Timberwolves. Now, all of these are big games, and all of those are good teams. Minnesota, Jim, that last game, are they going to sit people? Are they going to? Well, look at the standings. When you look at the standings, Minnesota's in first place, tied with the Denver Nuggets, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the Thunder, one game back in third. So with four games left for them as well, all of those games matter. So I, I, I feel like Minnesota, Denver, OKC, Jim, would you agree? They're not sitting anybody these final four games. Yeah, I'd say the odds are very slim that the Timberwolves go into game 82, like you said, against Phoenix, and it doesn't have some stakes because even if, you know, Minnesota, we're going to get into this as well, the number of games where there's two teams playing each other in the West that have something significant. But Wednesday, Minnesota plays Denver. And even if, say, Denver wins that game and bumps Minnesota down to second, Minnesota's still going to have to worry about the Thunder. So I, I don't think there's – yeah. I mean, you could almost crunch the numbers unless something really wild happens and there's some shocking upsets that we never could foresee. I think one way or the other, that game will matter to Minnesota. And I think almost everyone in Game 82 is going to have something on the line. In the fourth spot, you have the Clippers four games back. As I mentioned, the Suns are playing them twice. Mm -hmm. Dallas is in the fifth spot six games back, two games behind the Clippers. They are two games above the Suns and Pels. Let's stop here. We would have loved the fifth. The Pels were in fifth. They're in fourth for a week or a week ago. I think two back at the tiebreaker because of the division situation. Sure. You mentioned it. Mm -hmm. If the Pels didn't win on Friday... And they didn't. And the Mavs win on Sunday against the Rockets. And they did. 
They now have that division tiebreaker. Right. So it's essentially mm-hmm. a three game lead over the Pels with four to play. Would you agree? Right. Yeah. There yeah, go. I would agree. I, I would say that five is unrealistic at this point. I mean, Dallas still has a game against Charlotte and Detroit as well. So not only do they have the th- what you what realistically is a three game lead with four left, but they have two games that you would think. And I mean, we've seen Stranger Things happen. We sure. saw Stranger Things happen yeah. on Friday, but. I mean, it's, Milwaukee it's not lost looking the good. teams they shouldn't have. Right. But I, this is a yeah. I would I would tentatively rule out five as a possibility. I think right now you're just looking at can you finish sixth. So then you have the Suns, as I mentioned. We went through those four games there. So the Suns and Pels same. Now you're only a game above Sacramento, but however, Jim, Pels do have that tiebreaker on Sacramento right. because they won the season series. So mm-hmm. they essentially have a two game lead on Sacramento with four to play, and you play them on Thursday. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you you're, can control you're, whether or not you're above them. You're in point. you're in decent shape in that in terms of that. I think one thing that's interesting to look at, too, before we get too deep further into the week in terms of the schedule is just Tuesday night. If you can beat Portland, Sacramento's at Oklahoma City. If you can get that lead to two games, it's one now. If you can get at the two games, which is really three with the tiebreaker. Now you're really in position to to put them away and. Have them have no chance to catch you in the in head to head. So the Kings are at OKC, host New Orleans, host Phoenix, host Portland. The Suns, as I told you, Clippers, Clippers, Sacramento, Minnesota. The Mavs, you mentioned Charlotte, Miami, Detroit, and OKC. So you got that idea when it comes to that. As far as the Lakers go, Golden State at Memphis, New Orleans. They only have three games remaining. Mm-hmm. The Warriors at the Lakers, at Portland host New Orleans and host Utah. So that's where everybody's kind of jumbled because you didn't look at 10. They're guaranteed to play and spot the Pels, but they're only three games ahead of the Warriors in that final spot. So this week, it's it's Adam Silver's dream here because literally <laughs> every, everything is at stake. From 10 to 1, it could be a position shift, literally, in just one week's worth of games for every team. Yeah, and I think we should give a, a tip of the cap to the schedule maker because, I mean, it's impossible back in August when they make the schedule to predict how things are going to unfold. Yeah. But whoever did this did an amazing job. <laughs> Even if it, maybe it's a computer. who well, The computer was it was uh, outstanding as far as just how many of these games are between teams that are in the race with each other. And it's interesting, too. I think... Um, I mean, there's so many different directions we could go with this, and I'm going to write something that's more extensive and hopefully doesn't make people's heads spin later today on Pelicans.com <laughs> in terms of the race. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, for example, the fact that the Suns still play the Kings once, the fact that the Kings still play the Pelicans, that, that those that combination of teams that are 6, 7, 8, that's bad for the Lakers, for example, or the Warriors, because if they're trying to move up, you know, there are situations where someone has to win, there's no way that you can gain a game on multiple do, teams. Yeah, good, good point. And when there's this this little time left in the season, um, that makes it really tough where, you, you know, you're trying to gain ground, but there's matchups where someone has to win. Um, and that's why I brought up, not to interrupt you, but that's why I brought up the Lakers only have three games left. If the mm-hmm. Pels, that's why, look, tomorrow you got to go get that win. you got to go get that win against Portland because sure. every win now with so few games remaining, it makes it harder for other teams to pass you, if that makes any sense. So yeah. with the Lakers only having three games to try to make up a game and a half on you, if you win, then they win. It cancels each other. You have, tomorrow's win goes a long way mm-hmm. in just... <laughs> Just giving you a little bit more breathing room from nine and ten. Right. I just I don't want to I don't even want to be in the neighborhood of nine and ten. Mm-hmm. But that's what's crazy. You look behind. You look at the standings. The Pelicans are seven, eight, Sacramento, nine, L.A., ten, Golden State. The Pels are playing those three teams this week. I mean, so right. You know, in one way, it's what you want. You can control your own destiny. Win those games against those teams. They cannot pass you. Mm -hmm. Period. End of story. That said, if you don't win, they can pass you. Yeah, I feel like in situations like this, if you're the team behind, you'd rather have the situation where you're playing directly the teams that you're chasing. Right. If you're the team that's ahead, I think you'd rather play like just have everybody play some random team team in the East or something like that. Because like you said, it does. It's good because you control your own destiny, but it's bad because, I mean, teams can directly beat you and move up in the standings. But um but yeah, credit to the schedule maker. 
One one thing too that I, I want to try to be as concise as possible because I mean honestly we we could talk about playoff permutations and possibilities for literally the next hour and still not cover everything. But one thing I wanted to try to quickly mention is it, with with the Lakers and Golden State, the Pelicans can just beat those teams, and that's it. As far as though, if the Pelicans beat the Lakers on Sunday, the, the Lakers can't catch them because the Pelicans would have the tiebreaker. It would be two two, and then conference record, the Pelicans would have that. Mm-hmm. With Golden State, the Pelicans' magic number against Golden State is two, so obviously, just winning the game against the Warriors would take care of that because it would be your win and Golden State's loss. Sacramento, it's not quite such that if the Pelicans just win that game against Sacramento, it's over. But if they did win that game, they'd only need one other outcome. So, for example, if the Pelicans win on Tuesday against Portland and then they beat Sacramento, that would be, give the Pelicans 48 wins. It would give Sacramento at least 34 losses. So it would be, that would be a done deal as well. I'm not going to get into this part of it because it's just going to really confuse everyone, including myself. But you also have to factor in, too, that there's possibilities for three-way ties and you know, Sacramento lost Sunday or won Sunday night against Brooklyn, but in some ways, the fact if they had actually won, or if they if if they win one more game and move up into a tie with the Pelicans, in some ways that's beneficial because if there's a three or four team tie, the Pelicans went four and zero against Sacramento. So I mean, it actually there could be a, a scenario where finishing tied with the Kings actually helps the Pelicans instead of finishing you know a game ahead of them. The way it is right now, where they're one up on them in the standings. So, but I'm already getting people confused and myself as well. So, yeah. But we had to address it because that's what's at stake here in the final regular season week. Now, that said, you got to win your games and then you don't have to worry about a lot of that. But that said, going into the game yesterday, I'm going to be honest, we're setting up over there at Bayou Beer Garden and we just kept having people walk up to Aaron Summers and myself. How do you feel about today? And I'm like, it's a good thing we're at the bar. I, I just. I, <laughs> Friday was probably was, one of the rough. lowest points this yeah. season. Would you agree mm-hmm. with me on that? Friday's game? Yeah, I think it was not just one of the lower points of the season. I think for people mentally, discouragement-wise, it was up there maybe over the last couple of years just based on you know, losing that game and when you factor in where you were recently where you're all the way up to fourth in the standings. But, yeah, I mean, I don't want to downplay the, the significance of that loss because it was a huge loss and it was a it was a bitter defeat as well. But... It's funny because I had somebody come up to me yesterday before the game against Phoenix and say, like, man, I can't believe it. They always lose to teams at the in the bottom of the league that they should be. And I was like, um, I didn't have all of my stats and my details available at that moment. But mm-hmm. when I was looking at it, it's interesting to think that that loss, if you look at the bottom 10 teams in the or bottom nine teams in the NBA, so everyone that was eliminated from postseason contention, Houston became the 10th team to be eliminated last night. So if you look at the bottom nine teams in the league, before Friday's loss to the Spurs, the Pelicans had not lost to any of those teams since December 26th when they lost to Memphis with John Morant in uniform. So it's actually not really true that they've done, that they've lost a bunch of games to the worst teams in the league. They've actually gone, for example, also 10-0 and against the bottom five teams in the East. So, I mean, it was just, it was a one-off and it was, it was very disappointing. The fact that Zion didn't play stunk too, because you figure if he's on the court, I figured they they they'd come up with a way to win that game. I mean, Jose can't same deal. Like if you if you put any of those guys in in uniform, maybe New Orleans wins that game. So it was it was tough. Well, they were in uniform yesterday, and that's what I was saying. I, I didn't know how to feel because look, let's be honest. You're facing a team, and in particular, a player that had, at least recently had owned you. I mean, just really mm-hmm. honestly have. And, yep. and I I remember in pregame in Pelicans warm up kind of tossing it to J.D. and Todd in that second segment. I'm like, is today more about the Pels in terms of you get to show what you're sort of made of and and tested here, right? Uh, There's a basketball element to it. You know, you were getting Zion back. You knew you were getting Jose back. You know what you have to do. But it was more of kind of that sense and feeling, as I said, in post game as well. We've all been there before, whether it's one shape or form of being bullied or just a, a an uneasiness when you're at work or something, just something where you're, it, it, it throws you out of sorts mentally and emotionally. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I kind of felt like with this team, the most important thing yesterday was how you handle that and went to it. And the game starts, they get that early lead, then they're down 12, but they didn't, 
lose it in the mm-hmm. first quarter. And they started making some points here. Then they're up six at the half. And you're starting to get the sense and feel. You could see the body language on the court. Hey, I like this. And you have that moment where a couple technicals go the Pell's way, which is ridiculous. And I'm being very kind with that. When Devin Booker got the shove, Dyson Daniels. Into, but mm-hmm. Jose standing up and trying to calm himself down. He was kind, But they didn't lose their composure. And then, Jim, the moment happened. Zion Williamson said, I'm not losing this game. We're not losing this game. He said it in post game. You saw the defense. He had five blocks. You saw who's, I mean, it. there's so much to get into that when it, but I, I, to me, it was more of a mental thing. Can you face them and, and, and not be you know, scared for lack of a better word and, and go and match that. And, and Jim, they did. It was a big time gut check moment for the Pelicans. Yeah. I mean, like you said, all the stuff that you listed, the fact that, Devin Booker had scored 50 plus points against you in three consecutive games and you'd lost all of those two of them at home this season. And, in you know, the kind of fashion where it was like, man, if this guy plays like this, I don't, are we going to be able to beat this team? He ended up with only 20, only 25 points yesterday. He was 0 for five on three pointers. I thought Jose's defense was a huge factor in that as well, that he was able to, as Antonio Daniels said on TV, he was able to get up under him and kind of get in his space and make him uncomfortable which you would not have used the word uncomfortable to describe the way that Booker had played in the two games in the Smoothie King Center. But in terms of Zion, I mean, his just a fantastic all-around performance. In fact, they had 29 points, 10 rebounds, 7 assists, 5 blocks, and a steal. To me, among those stats, I mean, we've seen him score 29, 30 points constantly. His rebounding has definitely improved. His passing has improved. But the 5 blocks really stood out to me. Not just the number... But just the way that he was getting those, it just seemed like he was just in constant pursuit at the defensive end. There was times where somebody would dribble past him or some other defender would get beat Mm -hmm. off the dribble. And there was one play in particular that I love that I'm sure a lot of people know. It stands out vividly to them where Kevin Durant was driving by somebody and you're like, okay, he's going to get a dunk or he's going to get a layup. He goes up to shoot a layup and Zion comes flying in and blocks it, I think, off the backboard. And he's been just doing that so much more lately. You see his activity and and just his level of con- conditioning has gone up so much that, I mean, it was it was so much fun to watch him do that. And I mean, if if you we already have the Zion elite scorer, if you have, if you have the the um, just relentless defender and passer and rebounder the way that he's been lately, I mean, you're talking about a different level. Of the NBA, you're talking all NBA type player, you know, up a notch from the guy that's been in an All Star game or play, been a, named to All Star twice already in his career. I think one of the things that really stands out to me too is what you just mentioned too that defensive in- intensity and that. Pr- I mean, th- there were so many moments there. And again, that, that was kind of one of those cool things that you're at a watch party and you see that when Zion hit the midi. From the left elbow. Yeah, I didn't even mention that. Yeah, and mm. then, you know, he knocks that down. And by the way, Andrew Lopez of ESPN posted, it was the first time statistically they can find that he's hit two middies in a game, ever. I believe it. <laughs> so, I believe he, it. He, he hasn't really even attempted more than one shot, like, outside of the paint in many games. Since his first, since his very first game where he took a bunch of three-pointers, he he rarely does that. And when he did that, I'm like, if if he can start doing that, watch For out. Sure. And after the game, he said, hey, I, I, need to, I need to find ways to make it easier to score because they're loading the paint. And, and, he's, and he's getting that. But, Jim, that work on the defensive end, and, and I love what he said afterwards. If you want to be great, you want to be those guys. Durant, LaBooBoo, Steph, like, they come up big in big games. And, mm-hmm. and it's not just offense. It's, I think, a LeBron in those big games. You're blocking right. from behind on the backboard. Mm-hmm. You know, Steph getting the steal and all those different uh, aspects of it. And when when you hear that from him, I love it. I love when he says, hey, look, th- those are different moments on there. But I, we can want that. The player has to want to do that. Hear what he has to say about why his defense has gotten better the last couple of months? Um, I could definitely tell in the beginning of the season that, because I'm an offensive player as well, uh, I could tell that uh, the other team would try to hunt me on defense. And, 
you know, I'm watching the film and I, I didn't like that. So I just, like I said, watching her, it, it's inspiring. Uh, her, Jose, and Najee. Um, so I just started taking a lot more pride in it and worked on it and continue to work on it as well so that if I get called up, I can hold my own. So when you hear Zion say, hey, I know offenses were hunting me, that's pretty cool that he understands and recognizes it, Jim. You can sit there and be like, look, it is what it is. He took it personal. He's kind of like the Michael Jordan, you know, 30 for 30 <laughs> right, documentary right. or whatever I it was. I took that very personally. And I took yep. it very personally. Yep. No, but I love that, though. I mean, because if, if you want to be great, you that that's what you do, right? Yeah. I mean, I think he's – it's it's part of his maturation. I think he's just recognizing a lot of different things. I mean, you mentioned how some of the greatest players in the game now and throughout the history of the NBA, it wasn't just they scored 40 points and – just took a, a nap on defense. They impacted the game every in every possible aspect that they could. So, you know, by the way, too, I was going to mention quickly, we've seen him after practice lately in the parts when the media has been let in even. I'm not talking about, like, behind closed doors. We've seen him in front of everybody working on that mid-range shot. So there's been a couple practices lately where I took a couple of the other writers aside, and I was like, man, look at the work that he's doing on that shot. And it was looking really good. Wasn't sure... If it was going to be this season that he started to unleash that during games, but man, that was really cool to see him bring it out in the game and not just a game, but the most important probably win of the season so far. But yeah, he's he's been you know working on that, and you could see it. I mean, the more comfortable he is with the shot, the more we'll see it, and the more it was great to see him make a couple of those. Because imagine how difficult he's going to be to defend if now you have to worry about, oh, wait, is he going to pull up and take a 15-footer? 100%. Because these other teams, I mean, including Phoenix, every team that he's played lately, they're going to pack as many guys in the paint as they mm -hmm. possibly can. Joel and AD were complaining yesterday about how Yusuf Nurkic, I think, has only been called for one three-second defensive violation in it's the incredible. two games, even though he's been <laughs> you know camping out there. He's right. been toasting some marshmallows mm -hmm. right underneath the basket. But, man... Hey, if, if you want to stand underneath the rim, if if you have the, the mid-range shot, that's that tactic won't work. I think what was interesting, too, and we talked about being able to mentally withstand this, right? It's one thing facing a team that probably walked into that game having a little confidence. The other aspect, too, that I thought was real interesting, it, you know, the graph picked this up. Zero personal fouls in the first quarter by the Phoenix Suns. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Not a foul called on him. At yeah. the end of the day, though. First quarter was rough. End of the day. Personal fouls for Phoenix, total, 17. Personal fouls for the Pelicans, total, 17. Free throw attempts, 19 for the Pels, 14 for the Suns. It's what CJ and everybody, they're, let, they're getting you ready for playoff basketball. They're letting them play. And at the end of the day, it might feel that way now. It's the moments and stuff like that, but... Quite honestly, it's it's right there. And you saw in the homestand, there was a game where you felt like the Pelicans weren't getting the calls and things of nature, but um, they only had two more free throws than the Pels in, in one of those games that happened. I think it was Wednesday before the Spurs game. It might have been the Spurs game. It was one of those where it felt like the, the team kind of maybe had more than, um, than, than the Pels originally had. But my point being... yeah. This this is what's going to be like, and I thought they handled a little bit a little bit better. Now look, there's still going to be some ticky tack. There's still going to be all of that, but don't you think that that was key yesterday? Not letting the lack of whistles or the officiating kind of get to you because it was a factor to an extent there in the homestand. Yeah, I mean to some extent, it's one of those deals where it's like you just got to stick with it. If you're not getting the calls, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you stop driving to the basket. I thought Zion was pretty relentless as well in making sure that he was putting his head down and getting through some of the gaps that they had in the paint. Um, he was six for six on free throws in the second half. So another thing too, he was seven for eight overall at the wow. line. So, I mean, the, the list of positive developments and encouraging things that he provided yesterday is extremely long. I mean, we when him going seven for eight from the free throw line is like, not even near the top of the list, man. That's a really good day. And, mm -hmm. I mean, it bodes well for, obviously, the rest of the season. But just, I mean, almost to, even to almost a greater extent, just the future for him, the, the fact that he's adding all of this stuff. And imagine with, you know, an off season where he can continue to work on this, what kind of player he's going to come back to be 
at the beginning of next season, but we're always already extremely pleased with what we're seeing 78 games into this season from him. Yeah. Now, like I said, I think one of the things that really stand out um, to me is just that not only what Zion did and the rest of the team, that CJ McCollum, again, I, I think there's statistics that I saw pop up yesterday. I mean, the Pels are like 21 and something when he scores 20 points and mm-hmm. 30 points and all that. He, he matters. Jose Alvarado's performance, they don't win that game without him. Yeah, I mean, it was great to see him back. And you think, okay, he's been out for the last five games. He hasn't played since the March 26th game against OKC. He's probably going to need a little time to get his feet wet, you know. Like, you can't expect him in his very first game back to be dominating the floor. But what does he do? He comes out and he goes five for eight from three-point range. I mentioned already the defense that he played against Booker. Um, just a just an immense impact that he was able to make. And I mean, like you said, I mean, just since the all-star break and I'm going to get into stuff with Jose Alvarado a little bit more later in the show, but since the all-star break, they're now Pelicans are now 11 and four when he plays and two and six when he doesn't play. So, I mean, that right there shows you a lot. And um, it's funny because I feel like he's maybe the most, he's one of the most popular players on the team. But just like every NBA player, I think he still has some naysayers and some people who are just like, yeah, I don't know how much of an impact he really make, makes. I When I tweeted out some of the stats about the team's record with him on the court yesterday, there was a few people who were just like, yeah, this is misleading. I don't think he really makes that much of an impact. But mm-hmm. by halftime yesterday, Gus, I was already ready to talk trash to some of these people and be <laughs> like, are you sure? Are you sure about this? Are you sure that he doesn't make a difference? Because, I mean, his first half was huge. You know, you mentioned CJ. I thought both CJ and Jose in that first half, you're down 26-19 after the first quarter. It's a turnover festival by the Pelicans in the first five, six minutes of the game to the point where I was ready to go into graph mode in terms of my frustration. But then by halftime, you're up by six, and it was a lot of it because of those two guys. And, I mean, some of the stats were in terms of Jose and the team winning with and without him um, – are pretty similar for CJ as well. I mean, the, the chunk of the season where the Pelicans struggled the most back in November was when he had the the lung issue. So when he plays, I mean, their record over the course of the season is extremely good. I mean, it, it helps a ton to have ball handlers too. It helps a ton to have guys out there that can, you know, get you into your offense and set things up. But yeah, that was, it, it was de- definitely one of Zion's best games as a pro and most impactful and I think in terms of CJ's time here, that was you could also say that as far as that game and the, the the way that he made a huge difference by making seven threes and scoring 31 points in a game that you really needed to win to have a chance to stay in the race for top six. Yeah. What else stood out to you in that game? Yeah, I think um, I thought Dyson Daniels had a couple moments too. you know, offensively, he missed a layup and stuff like that, but he he had 10 points in the third quarter and that was a huge deal with him um i thought trey had some, murphy had some good moments maybe earlier in the game um another thing too is uh he went, willie's gone with an eight man rotation again so i mean he played jeremiah robinson earl for a little bit but for the most part with jose back it was jose dyson daniels and larry nance off the bench obviously um Larry played the vast majority of the minutes. And I didn't realize this too until after the game when I looked at the box score of how good of a game he had statistically. I knew he was making a, a, an impact and a difference, but man, he was across the board a huge help. And I mean, there were so many positive things. I feel like that part of the game maybe was overlooked a little bit, mm-hmm. including by me, until I looked at the stats. Well, I'll tell you what, I, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting week. That is for sure. It is. I mean, we're going to, I feel like every, you know, over the, the season is so long and over the course of the season, it's kind of like a glacier pace. Like there aren't, there are a lot of times between like our Monday and Wednesday episode, there isn't like a gigantic change, but I feel like one of the things I'm looking forward to this week is that by Wednesday, Mm -hmm. we could be having a totally different conversation about what the situation is with the team and the same thing for Friday. And then heck by I can't believe this, but ne- oh, seven days from now, we're going to know exactly where they are in the postseason. We're going to have all the matchups, and it's but it's going to be a lot of fun, I think, between now and then getting to that point. All right, Jim, as always, we love to look at a couple of things on a Monday, and that is? 
I ha- I'm going to look at the player to watch. I did not do a player of the week this week, but hopefully that will return next week and we'll have a nice fun poll that we can put out on X in advance of the postseason. Um, my player to watch this week is Jose Alvarado. And one of the things that I thought was interesting about him in terms of the opponents that the Pelicans are playing this week. So he played in both Portland games. Pelicans won both of them. He played in three of the Sacramento games of the four. They went 3-0 and in those games. He has not played against Golden State this year, which is c- kind of odd. One of those games was really early in the season. And then... He's the Pelicans are one and two against the Lakers in the games that he's played. Um, one of them, unfortunately, was not that long after he returned from injury was the the uh, in season tournament game. So against this collection of teams, the Pelicans are six and two with Jose this season. They're one and one without him in the in the games that um, he hasn't played. Um, actually, no, they're two and one without him. Um, the they're, this season, the Pelicans are 35 and 17 with Jose Alvarado, 11 and 15 when he doesn't play. So I mean, I I thought just with him having the game that he had Sunday, we've seen him so many times, and I feel like I don't even need to remind people this. It seems like not only is he kind of a gamer as far as he comes up big a lot during the regular season in moments when you need him the most, but I mean, think about the the way that he played in the playoffs two years ago when he had the opportunity to do that. Unfortunately, last season he was injured and wasn't able to play at the end of the regular season and then missed the play-in game against OKC. And that was disappointing because, you know, you were hoping that he was going to get a second straight year mm-hmm. to go in the playoffs, do what, remember what he did against Chris Paul two years ago with how intense that was. So I, I have my eye on Jose Alvarado this week because of not just the game that he played against Phoenix on Sunday, but... He just seems to be that kind of player that rises to the occasion, and I can't wait to get to see him play in the postseason, and hopefully that concludes with his second playoff appearance over the last three years. No doubt. This time he gets to close out the season strong as opposed to last year where he was crossing his fingers just like all of us Mm -hmm. and hoping that the season would extend long enough for him to get back on the court from the injury, which you know that sadly didn't him. happen. You know oh, that sure. bothered him, no doubt. For uh, sure. I'm with you, and he said that yesterday in post game against Phoenix. He, he just he can't wait to get back into the postseason, and I can't believe we hadn't even hit on it because there was so much yesterday, but we will close out with this. Brandon Ingram was shooting on the court in pregame yesterday. An update came out on Saturday. He has been cleared to do individual work on the court, which is kind of what we saw yesterday. We had seen him last week here before they left, just shooting flat-footed on the court. Yesterday, jump shots from threes and all of that. He has been ruled out the next two games. Right. Okay, that was yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's tomorrow. My guess is if things continue to progress, maybe you see him in one of those back-to-backs. There's no way he's going to see him in a back-to-back in both of them. Mm -hmm. But maybe one of those two. If not, Jim, we could see him Sunday. Uh, Regardless, he's good. My guess... I would I would be shocked if we don't see him in the play in game next week right. if they're to play in, mm-hmm. which is another incentive as you keep saying. If you get that six seed that entire week next week, you're off. You won't play until Saturday or Sunday of the following week. Right. So that kind of helps you a little bit there to give him another week. But seeing him shoot on the court, knowing that he's only been ruled out the next two, no timetables to win, but. That, that gives you an idea that maybe, just maybe, might seem towards the end of the week, but I, I feel better that if I am in the postseason, Brandon Inger will be available. For sure. And not just the part about how, you know, if you get in the top six, you get that week off, but if you can get him back on the court, your chances of being top six are improved by a, a good amount as well. So, yeah, I mean, I would love to see him be able to get on the court. Obviously, you don't want him to rush into anything if he's not ready to play, but... That was encouraging to hear that maybe he's getting closer to being able to play. And I know we'll get into this on Wednesday and then Friday, but, I mean, I think a lot of people around here are hoping that the game 82 against the Lakers is not a monumental (laughs) thing. But, I mean, I do think that Mm -hmm. it's almost unavoidable at this point that, like I said earlier in the show, that uh, game 82 is going to have some significance. Hopefully, though, you'll have put enough space between you and – some of these other teams behind you, including the Lakers, to where it won't be so much of a, you know, you have to win this game or you could drop. Because I, I still have bad memories yeah. and flashbacks from Game 82 last season when they went into that game against Minnesota thinking 
if you win this game, you're in terms of playing, you're a decent shape. Yeah. But if you lose this, it's a disaster. Yeah. And it, so hopefully well. by Sunday afternoon when they tip off in the Smoothie King Center, Pelicans will be in, in better shape than they were last year. And I mean, if they play like they did Sunday, that will definitely be a likely possibility. Here's the thing. As great a win as it was on Sunday, doesn't mean anything if you can't go take care of your business on Tuesday. You have You're to right. take care of your business mm-hmm. on Tuesday. Yeah, you'll that be back in the same position that you were in after Friday. Because you know the, mm-hmm. the next three uh, got a little little meaning in that. Well, for those teams, you know, so mm-hmm. you, you have to go take care of your business. Get your rest, take your nap in, get whatever you got to do today, yeah. and, and come out ready to take care of business tomorrow. I, I mean, if you can win Tuesday night against the Trailblazers, a team that has obviously been struggling lately, you can sit, kick back and for a day or two and watch the other games root for the outcomes to go the way that you want them to be. And then you win Tuesday night and then maybe Thursday when that game tips off, Mm -hmm. you're in even better shape than you are right now. So hopefully that'll happen. That's your mic and offer what's coming out here in a little bit, a comprehensive study on the playoff. Yes. I'm going to try to explain and, (laughs) and write as much as I possibly can about the playoff race and where the Pelicans are sitting. Some of maybe even get into some of the magic numbers in terms of combinations that, the Pelicans need to, you know, we've talked about how they're in the top 10. Next, we want to make sure that they can't finish 10th, then 9th, then 8th, then 7th, and hopefully they'll be in 6th. I saw a rough draft, folks. 2,024 pages <laughs> to coincide with the year. <laughs> wow. 2,024 yeah, pages. You know how long it would take me to write 2,024 <laughs> pages? A lot. <laughs> you would have had to start to work on that quite some time. Well, yeah. Thank you, Jim, as always, man. Appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. Jim underscore Eichenhofer is the way to go and check him out over on social media. And of course, pelicans.com. We'll see you on Wednesday, hopefully, to talk about another Pels victory on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.